Great to be with you, and I'm going to try to cover a very uh, important topic and large topic today with you. And this is the big contradiction of our world today, which is on the one hand, we've never been more prosperous, we've never lived longer lives, we've never lived healthier lives, but on the other hand, we're living this deep political convulsion with the election of Donald Trump as president of the United States, Brexit, and many others. It feels a little bit like, you know, the Magic Mountain novel by Thomas Mann, where in this spa and in the valley that is the world, something is brewing. So I'm going to try and provide an answer to what is brewing in the world. But let me go back to the beginning first uh, and take you through my thinking about this issue. Now, this graph covers 4,000 years of history. So it goes back to 2000 BC, and this is our time. And what you have plotted here is World Population and Social Development Index. Social Development Index is a measure of material wealth. So as you can see, linear development for almost 4,000 years, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and then boom, right? Both measures skyrocket. We live right up here uh, on this curve, right? This brings with it many benefits, but as I will argue, also big, big challenges. Now, this is also true of global GDP. I can show you a ton of measures, also data, right? So in the last... Uh, uh, year, we produce more data than in the previous 20,000, right? So this, this issue of exponential change, all of our economic growth from a historic perspective, the real, the transcendental change was our capacity to use science and technology for the production of goods and services, right? This, by the way, is another measure of velocity of change. So this is the time that it took these technologies to reach 50 million users. So it took the telephone about a century, a little bit under a cent century, Facebook, three years and a half. Angry Birds, 35 days. Pokemon Go, about six days, okay? So you get a sense of how this is speeding up. Uh, now, why is this happening? There are many explanations out there. My thesis, of course, is that this is due to tech. Many of you know of Moore's Law. Every 18 months, the cost of processing power halves. Uh, and this is, this is propelling huge change along these vectors. This is the McKinsey, you know, uh, uh, 12 technologies. You could come up with any other uh, set of tech, cloud technology, Internet of Things. What's interesting is not just change along all of these vectors, but the convergence of these. That's what makes change exponential and very hard to predict, right? Now, this brings with it many challenges, but I'm going to narrow them down to two. And as you can see, I'm going to start landing this framework, this backdrop on the current political trends in our world. One is a huge disruption in the jobs market, and I'll show you some data on this. And the other one is wage and stagnation in the middle and growing inequality within our countries, okay? We've seen major shifts in the jobs market in the past. This is what happened to employment in agriculture in the United States from 1860 to about the middle of the 20th century. So about 60% of the American labor force used to work in agriculture. In 100 years, it went down to single digits. There are less than 5% of Americans working in agriculture today. And the US is a net exporter of food. That is because at the same time, we had a huge explosion of productivity. OK, so this is corn. I could have chosen any other product. Uh, this has also happened to manufacturing. So this is employment in manufacturing in the US from 1980 to today. So about half a halving. Uh, of the population of the labor force working in manufacturing, at the same time, a huge explosion in output, industrial output, okay? So the US, despite what President Trump says, is actually reindustrializing in terms of output, not in terms of jobs. In 1980, okay, you needed about 25 Americans for every million dollars of output in industry. Today, you need about six Americans, 6.4. So that gives you a sense. Collapse in employment increases in productivity. Now, and this brings us closer to the discussion today, this is starting to happen in the services sector, okay? This is a study from the Oxford Martin School from 2015, and basically this wonderfully academic and impossible graph to read, but that's academia for you guys right there, uh, says that about 47% of current jobs are in high risk of automation in the next 20 years. Most of those jobs happen to be in the services industry, okay? Many of them, so translation services, travel agencies, transportation, all of those because of the impact of tech 
are going to be automated in the next 20 years. Just in transportation, I'll give you a figure. There are about 3 million jobs in the United States in risk of automation because of self-driving cars, okay? So this is what has started to happen and what's coming in the next two decades. Now, this might be the most important graph in the presentation. It looks terribly boring, but it's actually fascinating. And what it shows is that from 1973 onwards, we've seen a decoupling of productivity of goods and services and labor wages. So if you, if you simplify uh, our, our um, development model, basically, we, we always thought by increasing productivity, that would trickle down through wages and feed into a middle class. It will, it will create a middle class through wages. That has ceased to happen since 1973 in the United States. Okay? Our main redistributive tool, which are wages, have ceased to function. Uh, a lot of wealth has been going to capital holders, people that own robots, own algorithms and others, and, and, a, and, a, and a decreasing proportion has been going to wages. Okay? This brings with it the second challenge, which is the stagnation of income in the middle. This shows the percentage of households in these countries that had flat or falling market income in that period. Okay? So 90% of Italian households saw their income stagnate or decline in that period. My thesis, over 80%, of US households. My thesis, this is dynamite right at the heart of our democracies, okay? This, this level of stagnation in the middle. Now, of course, you know, by the way, this is data also in the US by Rach Chetty, who's an academic at Stanford. He calculated ba based on tax data what the probability was of an American born in these generations of earning more than his or her parents. So if you were an American born in the 1940s, you had a probability of over 90% making more money throughout your lifetime than your parents. If you were born in the 1980s, that had declined to 50%. So this is, in effect, the end of the death of the American dream, right? Intergenerational economic mobility. Now, if you have a large period of economic wealth and prosperity, and by the way, let's not forget this, the United States, the UK, most of, most of the Western countries have never been more prosperous than they are today. The last 30 years was a period of huge economic growth but you have stagnation in the middle, what's happening? Basically, you have a growing, uh, growing inequality. This shows, this, this line here shows the percentage of US pre-tax income going to the top 1% of Americans. So as you can see, huge boost uh, in that period. This graph in turn, in turn shows you about 300 years worth of history of inequality in the US. It shows you the wealth held by the top 1% of Americans over time. So as you can see, it keeps on going up and down. It hits these, these points where you have a big big political fracture, whether it's the Depression or war, and then it goes down. Right now, we're sort of 1920s, 1930s levels of inequality in the US. In the UK, you would have to go to about the middle of the 19th century, 1850s, to find levels of inequality like the ones we have today. And this is at the world level. 2015 was the first year where the bottom 50, uh, bottom 99% of the world had less wealth than the top 1%. Um, now, this has three consequences. Many, I'll narrow them to three. One is uh, pessimism and anti-elitism. The second is the barbarians at the gates of our system, in many instances within our system already. And the third and most worrying is the loss of faith in democracy as a system of government. Now, pessimism and anti-elitism, this is how these economic trends hit the political system. So if you're trying to make sense of what's going on in the world, why the Brits are voting for Brexit, why the French are thinking of voting for Le Pen, this is probably uh, uh, as good an explanation and, uh, as there is out there. So this was a poll done by Pew two weeks before the US elections. And they asked people, is life for you or people like you better or worse than 50 years ago? 81% of Trump voters said it was worse. In the case of Hillary, it was 19. So if you were a pessimist two weeks before the election in the United States, you were probably voting for Trump. Okay? This is also true uh, in Europe. So this, they ask people, do you think your children are going to be better off than you in the future? And 60% 60, 60 in the US and 64 in Europe said they're going to be worse off. So solid majorities of people within our societies think we're headed in the wrong direction. Okay? Now, this, is, this produces deep anti-elitism because it's the elites that have built that system that is not delivering. Here you have net levels of trust okay, in these groups by people that voted to leave the EU you know, and in the UK, and these are the lighter uh, bars. And as you can see, Brexiteers, people that supported the UK leaving the EU, had net, negative net levels of trust in these groups in elites. Okay? And these elites actually expressed their opinions very clearly and said Brexit would be a catastrophe, but we still had Brexit. Okay, so this produces this, which is uh, these barbarians at the gates that are here to break the system. This is support for extreme right and extreme left-wing parties in 33 European countries since the 1980s. 
This is net levels of trust in the EU. We're around about, we're under 40% in, uh, in the average right now. And this is what the economist has called draw bridges up, which is this new economic class that is emerging. And by the way, this is an important point. It's not just the unemployed that are voting for these people. It's the underemployed people that are employed but would like to work more. The subemployed people that think are, they are better educated than the job they're currently doing. And the precariously employed, the working poor. So this new class, which is the precarious, uh, is the one that is voting for these people, right? And it's producing what some people have called the anti-liberal era, which is they are, all of them actually have a lot of similarities. They're anti-trade, they're anti-cosmopolitanism, they're anti-regional integration, right? So they share this agenda, which is attacking the system that has failed so many, uh, so many people within their middle class, okay? Now, the third consequence, and this is the most worrying in my mind, is the collapse in faith for democracy, on democracy, sorry, in democracy as a system of government. Okay, this is World Value Survey data, very recent, was published by two colleagues at the government department at Harvard, and basically they asked people, do you think it would be good or very good for the US president not to bother with parliament or elections? Okay, so they're basically asking them, you know, how much do you support authoritarianism? And the figures have been steadily going up, so about a third of Americans today would say, yes, you know, I think that's a good thing. Now, this is the other side of the same coin, which is they asked Americans born in these generations, and Europeans as well, uh, the 1930s, the 1940s, etc., if they thought it was essential for them to live in a democracy. Okay? So as you can see, the figures go down. So the younger the people are, the, less, the least likely they are to say that it's essential to live in a democracy. This is the same data across the Western world. So as you can see, declines as you move, as people become younger and you approach the millennial generation, the least likely people are to say that it's essential to live in a democracy, okay? So the people have now lost faith in the system, a certain proportion of them, and they're no longer anti-elitist or anti-establishment. They are starting to be anti-systemic, right? They, they think that the framework, the political framework, simply does not work for them. So let me conclude with this because we have very little time. And I'll tell you, I think that we're currently, what we're currently experiencing politically is the consequence of a deep and structural change in an economy produced by technology, uh, and particularly its impact on the jobs market. That's the contact point of that change. Uh, I think uh, that the consequence is a political convulsion of which we're only living the beginning, um, and the collapse of the liberal order and the erosion of the liberal order. The historical analogy that helps me the most to understand what is going on is the early 1900s end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, when we also had a big shock to the economy, the emergence of a new economic class. At the time, it was a proletariat. In our time, it's the precariat. And a political convulsion. At the time, it was two world wars, fascism, communism, and others. Now, the big question is, what is the solution to all of this? Right? The solution is going to entail, in my mind, a, draft, a drafting of a new social contract. We're only at the beginning of the debate of what this means. But for sure, that contract will have to take into account issues of equity, empathy, justice, and distribution. The liberal order has been a huge generator of wealth. We have never been more prosperous than we are today. But we're facing a major challenge when it comes to the equity and justice of the system. This is, in my mind, one of the greatest questions for political science and for governments uh, around the world. And I hope that we all start thinking about this very deeply and find a solution very soon. Thank you very much.